Good afternoon. Welcome to Nordic Welfare Center and to this webinar on tactile language. My name is Maria Kreutz and uh, I work as a senior advisor uh, at NVC uh, with the deaf blind issues. Before we start everything, I would like to share some practical things uh, with you participants. You are not able to activate your camera or the sound, but we will mostly welcome you to write down uh, questions or reflections or anything in the chat. And then uh, we will collect them in the end of this presentation and uh, we will address them to Shirsten and have a short dialogue in the end. This webinar is recorded and after some editing, it will be published on our website. And it is also live transcription uh, this hour. So you find it in the button with closed caption and the interpreters sometimes correct my English. So for that reason, it could be a good idea to use it as well. As I mentioned, the webinar uh, is on tactile language. Of course, you know that. And it's based on the book. If you can see it, you can support it. The book, uh, the initiative to publish this book uh, is, came from the network on tactile language. And that network is coordinated by Nordic Welfare Center among other networks within the deafblind uh, issues. It has been an ongoing and quite long process and project with both uh, working uh, with the theme on tactile language, uh, publishing the book. And now this year, we decided to have a webinar series, uh, go deeper in some chapters. So this spring, we had five different chapters, uh, five presentations. You can find them on our website. And now this autumn, we will have three more. Next one is 4th of November. And the last for this year is 9th of December. And hopefully, we will continue next spring. And then we also will have some presentation on the Nordic Conference on Deaf Blindness in Tampere next year in September. But today, we will listen to Shisten Kostein, is the uh, number six, the sixth part in this uh, webinar series. So we would like to say welcome, Shisten Kostein from Norway. And you will say, we will go deeper in the chapter number 12. You are the author of that chapter. And now I need to read because it has a quite long uh, title, Embodiment from Bodily Experiences to Meaning Construction, Awareness of Things in the World. We're going to go back into the uh, chapter that I wrote for the book in which we discuss uh, embodied cognition and the way in which concepts and categories are developed out of our embodied experience. And we have the example of Jimmy, uh, not his real name, who is a boy with congenital deaf blindness. Um, and on this, uh, in this example, he is in the woods and he discovers something new with his teacher, who is me. And uh, I describe in the chapter what he appears to be doing when he begins to make some expressions and to take some action in relation to this new thing. So um, one of the things I want us to focus on here, I've sort of written a couple of questions, which is uh, in, for, to reflect on. I'm not going to go into the chapter, um, represent the chapter, although I'll remind us all about the example. But I do want to look at the way in which, um, or rather reflect over what it is that Jimmy might be perceiving, what he has discovered, what he's perhaps doing. He seems to be categorizing, is he categorizing a thing, an object, um, an experience, a quality of the world, or some combination of all of these things? Uh, and also, would he have been able to discover to perceive this new thing and then to perceive it more closely by exploring it uh, at all 
if he hadn't had a certain amount of prior experience that would have also been facilitated by various partners in different contexts. So I think the, the point here is that when we talk about forming concepts, we also are talking about putting, uh, making sense of details, making sense of disparate impressions of the world and putting them into holes or gestalts um, that can contain these details and make them make sense in relation to one another. And when children and adults who have um, CDB, uh, combined sensory loss and other uh, barriers to perception of the world in context, when they have, um, when they are going through their experience, the, the tendency seems to be that they become very overwhelmed by detail, by impressions that can appear to be quite chaotic at times, or to be meaningless, or to not have connection. And it's this ability to, that we hope to develop in ourselves to be able to support the putting together of things in meaningful ways that I want to focus on today. So um, here we have Jimmy, the case is, a boy is named Jimmy here. He is 10 years at the time I've said in, in the book between nine and 14. Um, and he has no auditory function at all, but a very complex residual visual function that is likely to be quite fragmentary and to, to be experienced by him is quite chaotic, depending on the circumstances. So um, it will be, his visual function will vary according to the time of day, to his state, to his, to his health, to his general well-being, and also in relation to how busy the visual environment is and how busy uh, the environment is in terms of what's going on. So if there's a lot going on, uh, a lot of uh, activity, that will also affect it. Um, <clears throat> but he is a, a very physically active child who can uh, run and walk and climb uh, unaided. He's uh, extremely active. And um, one of the ways that he makes sense of the world is by uh, moving uh, within it and, and exploring it physically. He has access to a large jogging stroller, which is of significance in this chapter, with wheels like a bike so that it can bounce over um, rocks and, and potholes when we go walking in the woods. And he has developed a sign for this um, stroller, which consists of a, um, a sort of B hand shape in sign language. Um, that he places in a uh, horizontal position against the back of his head and using two beats. And it seemed, when he began using it, it seemed related to the bumping of the back of his head up against the, the sort of sling seat of this stroller when he was going for walks in it. He needs to sit in the stroller in order to recoup his, uh, to sort of, um, rest, rest his, his eyes, rest his body, because it uh, requires a great deal of um, energy to, uh, to continue moving through the world, especially since he, he is very visually active and his uh, attempts at making sense of, of the visual input is um, uh, taxing. So he seemed to be referring to the stroller when he started using this um, sign, and we began to meet it as um, referring to the stroller. But of course, whenever a sign like that is, uh, is made up, um, starts being put into use, and the person has very few cultural signs, then it will, of course, refer to all kinds of things and states and feelings and wishes and comments that have uh, possibly nothing directly to do with the actual physical stroller. So he, uh, so as, as I put it in the, in the chapter, it can, could refer to a desire for a break, to, to have a time out, to go for a walk, to comment about a walk, to comment about something that happened on a walk, feeling tired, the memory of someone he went walking with, something he did, uh, and, and on and on. So, but at any rate, this, this sign has um, 
uh, been in, in use then at the, at the beginning of the, the case. So the situation then was that we were on a walk in the woods and we came across a brand new footbridge, a lot like the ones in the, uh, the story of the three billy goats gruff. So a, a small wooden footbridge, very high arc to it, uh, made ent entirely out of pine and not particularly painted in any way. So it was actually quite a, a, a very sort of blonde um, <laughs> looking, uh, bright shining thing that suddenly appeared as we turned a corner and we hadn't seen it the day before. So it was actually quite surprising. He saw this, uh, I surmised, because he jumped out of the stroller right away and down to, to the bridge. Um, and then as we, as I describe in the chapter, he, he gets onto the bridge. He doesn't go all the way on to the middle of the bridge, but he moves on to the beginning of it. And he notices then that it, uh, it bounces quite a lot underneath his feet. And he begins to uh, go through a kind of sequence of making the sign for stroller that he has already uh, been using. And he moves the sign down to the top of his spine. So from the back of his head, he repeats it twice, and then he moves it down to the top of his spine. Um, and he um, then the third thing that he does is he lies down prone on the bridge before jumping up again and then doing the same thing, just for a couple of beats, literally. Uh, so all of these actions seem to be very sign-like in the sense that they seem to be more comments about rather than the actual uh, business of, of bouncing on the bridge. And in the, um, so what, what he seems to have discovered here then is, is the affordance of bouncing that the bridge gives him. And an affordance is, we can think of it as an, a physical quality that um, can provide access to specific forms of action. So the bridge uh, in, in its structure is affording the experience of bouncing and he's discovered this, one could say. Um, so it's tempting in all this to say that he has in fact uh, discovered, or rather that, he, that he's talking about strollers and bridges and trampolines, uh, because as the, um, the chapter uh, example makes clear, he seems to be referring to a trampoline experience when he does the lying on his back um, move. On the, on, this, on the bridge. So he sort of talks about the stroller. He then extends the sign to the top of his back. And then he uh, appears to be referring to the trampoline that he likes to get going in motion and then lie down on so he can feel it moving underneath him and so on. So uh, we could even say that maybe he's talking about the word bouncy or bouncing. So what is it that he actually has discovered here. And that's, that's what I want us to look more closely at, looking at uh, the way that Heidegger talks about um, objects and our mode of, of encountering um, the world in terms of things in the world. So if we just do a quick recap, though, uh, with the chapter, I discuss uh, how uh, we can use several perspectives to, to look at how Jimmy might be categorizing his physical experience here. And one of them is the embodied semantic perspective, that the meaning of uh, concepts, conceptual awareness begins in physical movement in space and is uh, created through repetitive embodied experiences that uh, can be very minor and very, very micro. Uh, the experience as a baby of being lifted up and put back down in a crib uh, over and over and over again, uh, and other experiences of being taken up and put back down as a, as a very young child can uh, establish the schema of up and down. And then as we go along, we can become, uh, we can extend that schema to uh, many other experiences until the concept of up and down, the conceptual pair can be used to describe quite abstract states as well. Um, so if we can think about Jimmy's actions in that, late, uh, in that um, uh, light, we can see that uh, he's exploring the bridge through movement, but also uh, 
perhaps also commenting on what the bridge can provide him uh, with. And uh, it's an experience that he has also had in the stroller and an experience he's had on the trampoline, this bouncing. And Johnson, who talks about the uh, embodied semantic perspective, is concerned with how we basically extrapolate, not in a theoretical way from experiences of, for example, up and down, uh, but we extrapolate through metaphorical process of imaginative metaphorical comparison. And a metaphor, if we remember, is a, an implied comparison between two very, very different things. And the, the signal thing about a metaphor is that the things are usually more different than they are similar. And it is this connecting of very different things that expands our conceptual framework. So one of the things that I try to um, describe in the chapter is that is how through uh, raising the or using the expression for stroller, he seems to be extrapolating from that from his head being uh, bounced against the back of the stroller to to lower down and he moves the the sign down in the in that schematic way toward the bridge and then ends up lying on the bridge all in a kind of sequence that seems to be more uh, uh, to do with referencing these things than to do with actually uh, experiencing them. It's not that he is uh, enjoying the, the bouncing per se, he's but more that he's thinking about it. So it's this kind of metaphorical comparison, you know, that how is the stroller like the bridge, like the trampoline? These are all three things that are very different. Now, whether or not he is thinking about a trampoline when he lies down on the bridge is a, is a harder thing to describe the, um, the uh, uh, argument for now. And we won't get very far if I try to do that. But the, uh, the chapter makes a, a case for that. So... <clears throat> What we sh see here is a is, in a way, um, a kind of sense making process that he's going through, and Melu Ponty uh, also talks about how our bodies, through their movement in the world and friction between uh, the, the perceiver and the world, actually create what appear to be the fixed characteristics of the world. So certain qualities of, um, uh, of surface, for example, do not exist until uh, the perceiver starts to move his or her fingers, for example, over the surface to detect uh, the qualities. So in many ways, we are, uh, we are creating the, the qualities through our movement and, and our experience, just as much as we are taking them in, as, a, as it were. Um, Merleau Ponty talks about how language accomplishes thought, and he is not, he is not, I don't think, uh, talking about how thought and language are the same thing, that you, we are not thinking until we are linguistic, until we can use a cultural language. That's not what he's saying. But language comes along at a very reflective end of the cognitive spectrum. And if we think of cognition and perception as action and as embodied uh, interdynamic uh, system uh, interactions and engagement in, in movement and with the world, then we begin with these very, very simple experiences that are very sensor sensorily um, salient to us as babies and as, as, as we move through uh, life, and we end up developing um, a ways of reflecting these back to ourselves, and that is where language comes in. So Jimmy has sort of entered that um, awareness of language through having been uh, exposed, of course, as well to tactile signing. Uh, and although he doesn't use very many signs, he has at this point created some uh, himself. And uh, this is one of them. So it's this way of being able to take his experience that he's having right now and in a way represent it to himself in a way that, that, is, that allows him to look at his experience 
as an object almost, or, or to take it out and look at it. But again, we still can't know what, he, what it is he's actually, what is it that he is perceiving and what, is, what are the holes and the categories that he is constructing? So what is it uh, that is discovered? So if we look at Heidegger's um, conception here, um, we, can, we can begin to sort of think about how, how Jimmy is actually negotiating the world. Heidegger is talking here about three modes of encountering the world and things in the world. So he's, he's thinking about objects and how we, how we uh, relate to, um, to objects in our experience, for example. It's much more complicated than that, but we'll, we'll keep it at that. Um, so I want to get at the issue that object, understanding that something is a thing, is actually an incredibly complicated conceptual act. And it's also, when we talk about cognition, we, are, we very much are talking from a visuocentric and an adult-centric position, as Shawnees and uh, other authors have pointed out. We are, we're speaking in the language of the adult who has a lifetime of perception, visual perception, where it's very, uh, immediate, this, this distinguishing of, of figure and ground, of details in relation to context and to relationships between, between them. So we have to think about how that might, uh, might present itself to someone who does not have that access, like Jimmy. So Heidegger talks about three modes of experience of the world in his book, Being and Time. And his point is that most of the time we are doing things in the world rather than thinking uh, reflectively about the world. So in our ordinary everyday activities, we are absorbed in um, skillful, hopefully, engagement with things in the world and we're coping with it. So our experience of objects is more in terms of there being equipment that we manipulate rather than um, rather than as conceptual uh, um, examples of categories or, or um, as things in themselves. They exist for us in the moment as an extension almost of ourselves when we're in this, as he puts it, ready to hand uh, mode. So our engagement with things uh, uh, such as tools, uh, he uses the example of the hammer being used to hammer nails in. It doesn't aware, uh, it doesn't uh, involve a conscious or theoretical awareness of the properties of the object. So when we're hammering nails and we're absorbed in our task and everything's going well, we're engaged in building something and it's the building something that is important to us. Uh, so there is in a way a, a transparency there in this ready to hand mode. Um, when we are, yeah, the flow state, of, it's in, in a way we're talking about a flow state. So his, his description is very much an idealistic one or rather an ideal one of, of ready, when in the ready to hand mode. The ready to hand mode is where everything is flowing and we don't have to think about how to manipulate whatever it is we're, we're using to do whatever it is, we're engaged in the action. And the most important thing is the action. And we see this, I think, in, in uh, babies who, um, who throw themselves into engaging with the world and who are not thinking about what is this that I am now picking up in my hand. They're, they're using it to, to put in their mouth, to throw, uh, to, um, to uh, engage in. They're, they're much more in the ready to hand mode than not. Uh, the other, the opposite of that state then is unready to hand, which is when the object stops working, um, it, uh, or it, it can't be found, we, we go to get something we need to do something and it's not there, or when it uh, creates a barrier in some way to the activity that we want to perform with it. So if you're hammering something and the, the head of the hammer flies off the handle, then 
you can't hammer anymore. You become, it becomes unready to hand and the experience is one of, of, of um, abrupt um, disruption. And then the third uh, state then, which isn't, which is off by itself in many ways, is presence at hand, which is things as they are in terms of their qualities, in terms of their measurable characteristics, their weight, the color, the, sh the form, the shape, and so on. So uh, if we take one example of, of this that uh, some of us will know all too well, the using of reading glasses to read, for example. I'm sitting on the Metro and I have to dig around in my handbag to find the reading glasses. So I do that relying on my tactile, uh, tactual perception. And I find them and then I put them on my face and read. And in many ways, I am in a ready to hand mode with the glasses. I no longer think about the glasses I'm reading and everything's flowing along very nicely. But then when I get off the Metro, I forgot to take them off my face and I'm still not thinking about the glasses at all unfortunately, but I can't, I can't navigate very well because I can't really see the depth of where the floor is. I, things are looking very odd, very blurry. I'm staggering about trying to gain my balance. And then I realize that I've got my glasses, the reading glasses on and I have to take them off. Um, so part of, in, in this scenario, then we have kind of the identifying of the glasses, which in a way is a more, even though I'm doing it tactually, it's a presence at hand kind of mode. I'm trying to, to determine, to distinguish where are those glasses in relation to everything else I've got in my purse when I can't see the bottom of the purse, I find them. And then when, once they are on my face, they become transparent in more ways than one. They're allowing me to read so I can see through them and then I forget all about them. So they are ready to hand, or my experience of them is ready to hand. And then when I uh, am trying to get off the metro and I haven't taken them off my face, they're, they're totally not in my consciousness, but I am in an unready to hand state because uh, they, are, uh, they haven't been taken off and they are unfit for the activity that I'm trying to use them for. So in order to establish what's wrong, I have to go through a presence to hand kind of um, process to determine that, oh yes, I've got, why, why is this not, why can't I see? Well, it's because I've got reading glass. Oh, take them off and then everything's fine again. So we were sort of back and forth in these kinds of uh, um, varied sort of spectrum of ready to unready. So Heidegger, uh, in Being in Time has this to say about objects as things primarily, our, our experience of objects is that they are things in use or equipment to do things with. The less we just stare at the hammer thing and the more we seize hold of it and use it, the more primordial or foundational does our relationship to it become. And the more unveiledly, which means the more clearly, it's not being shrouded in anything, covered up by anything, is it encountered as that which it is, as equipment. The hammering itself uncovers the specific manipulability of the hammer, the kind of being which equipment possesses in which it manifests itself in its own right, we call readiness to hand. And when he talks about the manipulability uh, of the hammer that uncovers itself, um, we are talking about the other aspect of affordances in the world. So if an affordance is a quality of something, uh, the hammer affords knocking nails into wood, then the ability to build with the hammer is an effectivity that comes out of that affordance. And when we talk about affordances, theoretically, we often don't talk about the effectivity side of things. And I think that uh, that's just a, an aside. We, that's another lecture, but we'll, we'll have a look at that later on with, um, with looking at what Jimmy is doing with the, with the bridge. So our, the way we learn about things in the world then uh, is through using them and through this relationship of uh, he talks about 
the equipmental relationship that we have with objects and features of the world. So in the ready to hand mode then, there is no subject and no object. So the user of the hammer is aware of it, but the awareness in such contexts of use is not that of being someone. I'm not aware of myself, uh, particularly when I'm absorbed in doing something. When I'm totally in the flow, I'm not aware of myself as somebody who is doing something with a thing. I would become that in a subject and object um, uh, perspective if I was doing something I had never done before, because then I would be very self-conscious. I would be trying to do something that I didn't know how to do. So I'd be trying to follow directions and, and test out whether I really understood how to do whatever it was. And I'd be using something in an un, perhaps a new thing in an un, uh, unknown way. So in many ways, that's the opposite of the ready to hand uh, mode. That's a very present to hand mode. So phenomenologically speaking, in this mode, in the ready to hand mode, there are no ob subjects and no objects. There is only the experience of the ongoing task of hammering. So Jimmy in the gym, for example, uh, when hopping on the trampoline or being bounced on the trampoline as he lies there is absorbed in, in that whole experience when it's happening. But when he comes across the bridge in the forest, he is made aware of its ability to afford bouncing just like the trampoline, not just like it though, differently. And he seems to be reflecting on, uh, at least that is the argument made that he is reflecting on, on that by using something that he has uh, experience of from before. So, presence at hand, this is when something really becomes an object for us, when it becomes a thing. And this is when, and Wheeler uh, is, a, is a philosopher who describes this in relation to Heidegger's uh, uh, scheme then. When sensing takes place purely in the service of reflective or philosophical contemplation, that is to say, when you are trying to think about some, something and reflect over it, the entities under study are phenomenologically removed from the settings of everyday equipmental practice. So ordinary use of whatever it is, and are thereby revealed as fully fledged independent objects, that is, as the bearers of certain context general, determinate or measurable properties. So invariable or invariant uh, properties, like the bridge has a certain height, it has a, a width, when you walk over it, it has a color, it has these different uh, properties that you can measure. And when we are thinking about it, then as an object, it will, we were thinking about it in terms of uh, these properties. When we're using it, that's, uh, we're in a different mode. So in the presence at hand experience then, when something is, for us, for, for us an object that we're looking at, reflecting over, the experiencer then becomes a subject, becomes a cognitive um, inquirer in a way, whose project is to explain and predict the behavior of the universe outside of him or herself. So encounters with the present at hand then are thus fundamentally subject object divided in structure. And this is where language comes in as a tool that we can use to objectify our experience so that we can look at it and take it out of our immediate um, experiential universe and, and see it in front of us as it were. So in many ways, what Jimmy is doing is demonstrating his development of a subjective perspective on the world by, by taking out the expression that he um, uses with that is a sign for stroller in other contexts um, and using it in this context to to talk to himself about it if you like or to think about it and it's that that 
aspect of the whole scenario that I think is the most um, central. It's not so much exactly what he is thinking about that because we can't possibly know that, but he is he, he's using a sign that's very salient that is in use in his daily life, and then he extends it, and then he does something else which takes the whole thing all within a schema of down toward the bridge. Um, he takes his whole body and places it also in this kind of referential symbolic way uh, without remaining prone so that he can bounce uh, as though the bridge was the trampoline. He jumps back up again and he repeats it. And it seems to be this way of, of, um, of comparing. Uh, so he, in, in a way, is, is getting into the presence at hand uh, perspective, being able to theorize or um, think about what's going on and, and what things outside of him are. Now, in unreadiness to hand, disrupted activity, when the smooth practical activity, whatever it is we're doing, is disturbed by broken, uh, malfunctioning equipment, uh, we can't, we go to do something, we're ready, we're about to start and we discover we don't have what some crucial object uh, or something that is in the way. Now, when we are partnering people with CDB, we are very focused on preventing this from happening. We don't want unready to hand to happen. Who does? It's a pain. And we are constantly smoothing and making everything seamless and it all flows because we're trying to get rightly in me, as well to a state of flow where the person can be engaged in in motivating and interesting activity and that's it's a, that's a very important feature of, of being a good partner and uh and teacher but we also have to keep in the back of our heads that um the unreadiness to hand uh, experience can often provide um a uh, a learning opportunity and of course that's been written about in our field before the the happy accident or the uh, the the thing that goes wrong that turns out to be a very a learning um, situation so between ready to hand and okay when we're in the flow we're doing we're doing something and we're caught up in the doing we're not thinking about what we're using in the doing we're just doing and present at hand when we are thinking about what an object as a thing, something outside of ourselves or an activity as dependent on different objects and what are we going to do next? We're theorizing, planning, that kind of, um, uh, in many ways, more advanced in the sense of abstraction, uh, cognitive process is the present at hand. So, when encountered as unready to hand, things are then no longer transparent. Then we can no longer just get to the, the activity. We have to deal with them. So they become suddenly visible in a way or suddenly perceivable. Right. Yeah. So the objects that then become present at hand become so because they're status, sudden status as broken, something suddenly breaks, or as malfunctioning, not working properly, missing or getting in the way, obstructive, is defined relative to uh, a particular context of use as equipment. So they don't really come into being as objects uh, that are for themselves, just bounded within themselves until they can, can no longer be used as equipment. So unready to hand, in the unready to hand state then, when something breaks, for example, the subject, the, the being, the perceiver, becomes a problem solver, has to figure it out, has to look at it and, and sort it out. And as uh, Wheeler points out, a driver does not encounter a punctured tire as a lump of rubber uh, with a measurable mass and a weight. She encounters it as a damaged item of equipment, that is, as the cause of a temporary interruption to her driving activity. She encounters it then as part of the activity that is not uh, affording the activity anymore and will then have to go into a, uh, a kind of um, present-to-hand mode to try and fix that. 
So with such disturbances to skilled activity, the experiencer emerges as a practical problem solver whose context embedded actions are directed at restoring the smooth skilled activity. So the in-between state of unready to hand is a whole spectrum of experiences because we're, we're very rarely, uh, I don't think most of us can say that every day we are in the flow, everything is flowing, it's all effortless and wonderful. Uh, we, have, we have flow experiences and we get absorbed in what we're doing. Uh, if, if we're writing uh, a report for several hours, we can get an, engaged in that to the extent that we are very unaware of, of anything else really except what we're writing or doing. Um, but there is, for my, much of the time, a kind of um, spectrum of engagement and disengagement, uh, where things are in a ready-to-hand mode and then suddenly in an unready-to-hand mode briefly because some little thing has gone wrong or needs to be fixed or the telephone rings and so on. So I wonder, I think one of the questions we can ask ourselves is how does the person with CDB uh, which, of course, I know that I'm, I've not gotten into the detail of, of all of the complexity of that. But if we take uh, for the, our purposes now just a, um, a blanket sort of uh, definition of that, um, where is the person with this sort of combined sensory um, loss barrier likely to be much of the time in, in the context of the world? And we might think, well, yeah, maybe in a, in a very unready to hand mode because of being unable to, uh, to get to the contextual understanding to be able to use uh, things in the way that they would be able to do if they had access more to a more holistic perspective, uh, sensorily speaking. So, However, though, as Heidegger points out here, for something to be unready to hand, it has to first have been experienced as ready to hand, as affording some, some activity that, uh, that we can engage in so that it becomes transparent for us. Because we can't find something um, unready if we are un totally unaware uh, that it exists in the first place and uh, how it can be used. If we have no awareness of ready to hand, then we can't have any awareness of unready to hand. And I think that's probably where uh, a lot of people with CDB will be much of the time in a world full of seeing, particularly um, seeing people um, who uh, have access to, a, uh, to an immediate, immediate sort of access to context. So for most of us, ready to hand is the primary way of engaging with the world. As a being engaged in activity, which when smooth and skilled, erases both, both the object and the self-awareness. So a kind of flowing thing. For the person with CDB, this mode is difficult to achieve because things such as equipment, tools, uh, chairs, tables, means to an end, um, as possessing affordances for activity or even as in existence at all are not easily or consistently perceivable. There is something about this, this issue of, of things remaining the same because when, when children develop object uh, consciousness, object permanence, the idea that something uh, exists for itself and by itself somewhere, whether or not I'm using it or looking at it, able to see it, because again, we're talking very much about a visual centric um, way of looking at these things. Um, for the person with CDB, the things, the same thing can appear uh, visually, if there's visual uh, function at all, quite differently in, in different contexts. And um, the lack of, a, of being able to see the consistent context around things or, or have access to that consistent contextualizing of, of objects has things uh, remaining in fragmentation in, in separation from from one another so details will be perceivable and, and sometimes very um, very intrusive but they will be hard to put into consistent uh, dependable gestalts 
um, oh, sorry. One of the things that we know when we are doing uh, engaging in teaching, for example, is how important it is that details like the precise location of the keyboard for some, some uh, activity with the computer. When you're uh, working with somebody with CDB, the, the way things are, are placed, where, they're, they're, where you put them when you are finished with them and where you can find them again, all of these things are extremely important. This has to do in many ways with this whole unready and ready to hand kind of um, uh, uh, situation in a way. So barriers to the awareness of things, of salient, of, of things as objects, things that can be done something with as well. Difficulty distinguishing figure and ground and perceiving the, the, the prominence, the salience of, of a whole against a backdrop of other things. Uh, or within a context generally, the idea that form or shape uh, may not be the most prominent thing. Uh, if we're talking about tactual um, investigation of something uh, through, the, through the hands uh, or other parts of the body, but if we take the hands, yes, we can, we can and we do find and can trace shape uh, with our hands, but it may well be the case that microstructure the texture of something is far more salient for the person with CDB than is the form or the shape. Uh, also, there can be sub shapes. Something can be a ball, but the ball can be shaped with, with points in it that are not exactly a texture as such, or rather they're more macro than that. They're long sort of round uh, point structures around the ball. Some of the uh, massage balls like, are like that. And it may well be that that is the that is is the sort of um, uh, perception that is most salient, rather than the fact that this is shaped like uh, a ball. Also, the nature of tactile exploration is very fragmented and sequential. We it the tactile mode is a very compelling mode of sensory perception because there are few barriers to it. It, it is one of those. Um, impressions that goes goes in much more quickly uh, than others, and it's not as vulnerable to distraction by the other senses. But by the same token, there are only a, a limited number of bits of information of uh, can be communicated in the tactile mode at any more given sort of time. So there is a uh, rather it is a, it is not a mode that takes on lots of detail at once it has to it is a mode in which detail has to be explored sequentially and uh, that can that leads to obvious issues about time and the need for time and manipulation and a lot of experience to get to the point where something can be used um, in in a flow way as a in terms of ready to hand so to paraphrase the title of the book, uh, the tactile book, if you can see it, that is, if you can perceive it, you can use it. So the hypothesis that I want to just leave you with <laughs> is that um, it may be the case that the discovery of the world for the person with CDB may in some cases be supported uh, best by reversing the order of emphasis. Uh, that is usually the case. Usually when we're talking about um, the functionally uh, seeing uh, baby, uh, uh, child, we're talking about the beginnings of, of, of uh, engaging with the world and learning about it have to do with just getting in there and doing things with it. That of course is also very important for, for everyone, including people with CDB. But we forget that that world with that figure ground distinction where there is an object here and then there's other things over there and, and this is the context, that is a very visually um, uh, dependent perspective. For the child with CDB, there is a need to, to turn that around and go back and go toward the um, kind of present at hand 
mode of distinguishing details, qualities with the tactual uh, um, uh, perception, but also through movement, through manipulation, through gradually getting to know that this is a thing and that it has these qualities. I can recognize it because it's this and that. Uh, before we can really get into uh, using it, for example, um, there is, uh, for example, if we're trying to introduce the person to something like climbing, uh, which involves lots of um, equipment, or riding a horse, um, to, to sort of try and get right in there and get up on that horse and, and start uh, going isn't always going to be as successful as it might be. There is a need for a staged um, a staging, really, not just of getting to know the horse, getting to, to touch the horse, getting to get an impression of the size of the horse and so on, but also all the things involved in the scenario. And there has to be a kind of gradual, gradual, sometimes extremely gradual uh, introduction of these elements so that uh, there will be something worth doing and something perceivably interesting for the person to engage in. So we need to take almost a, a, a theoretical teaching about examining um, this as a thing and its qualities are such and such. We wouldn't do that with a child who, who already can, uh, through visual function, can perceive that, um, that here is something and, oh yes, I can, I can grab it. And, and uh, there's this whole world around me that I can move within and uh, trust. So, uh, so I want to suggest that maybe looking at, um, at support work and pedagogy in terms of uh, helping the uh, person in this kind of subjective, um, investigative, theoretic, theorizing kind of, of mode, which is present at hand, at strengthening that. And uh, last but not least, using language to do that. So. Uh, language is far more than simply a tool for, for communication, simply is, is not the, the word really, but uh, it is a, a means of investigating cognitively uh, the world. It's a means of helping the person who is, after all, in what may well be an experience, uh, instead of it being in a, in a world of things, of shapes, of forms, the person may, may well experience the world as, as a series of textures, a series of surfaces, the surface schema, whatever that is. And we're not talking about pictures, we're talking about a whole collection of sensory images um, in that, in the sense of, um, uh, but again, not, not uh, uh, purely visual or visual at all, but uh, the, the, the the experience may be one of, of one big surface, different surfaces, a kind of flowing state where surfaces are um, appear, uh, I'm in them, I'm on them, um, and then, then things change rather than a series of, of uh, things to discover. And it's in helping to put the, this kind of figure ground part whole perception together for the person to help structure it, um, introduction of, of activities and, and objects and so on. Also using naming, using the word to name things, helps to objectify experience and helps, to, helps the person to develop a subjective cognitive perspective of being some, someone who is perceiving something outside of themselves instead of it all being kind of uh, one big um, salad of, of things, inside, outside, me, not me. So all of this then uh, is supported in language as a, as a mode of objectification and reflection. And we also then support agency because one of the things that was so striking about Jimmy's experience in the woods as I observed it was that he was quite happy to, instead of racing over the bridge, which is something he might have done, 
previous previously and probably would again once he got uh, used to the bouncy uh, experience he was able to pause and reflect over it to to explore it conceptually uh, and also uh, as part of that through movement so it's an experience of, of a new thing a brand new thing that could be quite frightening if uh, in a visual world where one is uh, bombarded by, by hard to uh, define uh, impressions, but instead it becomes something interesting that he can then uh, enjoy uh, a session with himself um, looking into. And to follow up on that, one could then go into helping him explore the rest of the bridge and successive trips and begin to talk about the bridge, which may or may not be something that appears as a salient uh, form in his uh, perceptual world. And Jeez, through that, that give him more Jeez, abilities. Jeez, I'm so sorry <laughs> for interrupting you. No, I'm, I'm not. Jeez, we got yeah. this far. <laughs> Thank we, you. We Maria. had an agreement. She's a yeah, nice we did. We do. participants. Yeah. You don't think I just interrupt like this. But you have, no, you don't have to stop it. You could have just one one minute so you want to conclude maybe then we have two minutes for questions if you I want think i have concluded let's see uh i can just read uh two sentences maybe that will help i don't know uh, a step further for the partner in this situation and further in other situations is to explore this thing the bridge with all its qualities and to name them and this facilitates the forming of a concept about bridge and the expansion of the concept of things in the world, in the exploration and naming with signs of all the qualities of that which is, can be a bridge, one also explores many other concepts that can be transferred to other experiences of other objects. In this way, a conceptual apparatus is built, as well as a linguistic practice connected to embodied experiences. So it's, a, it's a, yeah, both, working with both, always. If you are having this chapter, <laughs> you are looking at it and you will try to to reach and understand where to where to start. Do you, would you suggest if you have a, a student with congenital deaf blindness, what would be the first step step, do you think? Um, I think maybe thinking something to do with um, with um a new activity uh, is that what yeah. you're sort of trying to introduce if you know that you're going into uh, or you're trying to expand uh, the repertoire um, mm -hmm. building on something known of course all of these things are fairly obvious and, and most people um, it's not like this is brand new stuff but it's a way of, of thinking in terms of the act of distinguishing things yeah. perceptually is a complicated one uh, when the person can't uh, see, especially, but also when there is a, this dual sensory a loss. Um, so having that kind of, uh, having in mind that you are showing this person ob the object, for example, if it's something like a, a climbing harness, for example, you need to get used to a cli climbing harness before you can start getting to grips with climbing. That the yeah. ability to kind of get to grips with all the interesting details that may have nothing to do with the activity itself, but, mm. but sort of teaching the child all about how to explore the thing, how it is like this and it's like that, and you can open that and you can then it makes a noise, you know, if you can use uh, sound or vibration and all of those things. Um, uh, I mean, with one, with one student with, who was completely uh, deafblind uh, and, and an activity, there was an emphasis on um, sitting, because sitting was uh, crucial to the activity, and on um, making a kind of progression toward, it was to do with horseback riding, so uh, making a progression of, of uh, things to sit on before getting all the way up to, um, yeah. to the horse, <laughs> <laughs> and then that kind of thing. So yeah, so basically what, what I mean is, is going into a kind of uh, theoretical mode in a way. Not, mm. not going straight into, 
okay, now we're putting this on and we're going to start trying to climb, like not having that kind of, we already know what this is for, or that it's for this, but mm. it's a weird thing, the harness. It's got all kinds of things on it. And it's, uh, so instead of, of, of thinking that we're training the child to use it to, to um, uh, in, in the context of the activity right away, we start with going through it like scientists and looking at, at all the bits and pieces and things that are to do with it. <laughs> and you take a new, new perspective, I, I assume that you are meaning. Thank you so much, uh, Shirsten, and thank you all participants who has been joining us. And you can, of course, uh, see this um, presentation whenever you want to, when you find it published on our website. And the next one is uh, 4th of November, and the third part is um, uh, 9th of December. So then we will continue. Thank you so much, everyone, and hope to see you again in November. Have a nice evening.